Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another special edition of a podcast brought to you by the Falcons Podcast Network. I'm Tori McElhaney. I'm joined by defensive coordinator Dean Pease, and I want to start the podcast off by saying that I think that we maybe have found a name or perhaps figured out a name for this special edition podcast, and I wanted to run it by you before we made anything official. We were thanking Peas in a Pod. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. I, I'm, I love a good pun. I love a good w- word play. And our digital team was like, we think this works. Do you like that? That's whatever you guys like. Okay. I like. I'm fine. Okay, fantastic. Because we were like, peas in a pod, it just makes sense. And like with the <laughs> podcast, we're good. Um, so if you didn't join us for the very first episode, go back and listen to it. Because we talked a lot about coaches' history getting into the game at the high school level and then on to college. But today, we're actually going to move into you and your career making the jump to the professional league. Um, You did so around the 2000s, which is a time of horrible fashion, but otherwise great football. (laughs) Now, I I, I wanted to start off, you know, you were the head coach at um, Kent State. And then you go to the New England Patriots at the the turn of the the two thousands. Yep. Um, for you, why did you want to make the jump from college to professional? Well, you know, in all honesty, Tori, I don't know that I did want to. <laughs> it's kind of like when I left high school and went to college. I didn't really uh, go to college going, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to get out of high school coaching and go to college. Um, the situation presented itself that I could go to a college and try it, and if I didn't like it, I thought I'll go back to high school football. And so the kind of the same thing happened with the NFL. Uh, I'd been the head coach at Kent for six years. Uh, Things were starting to move in the right direction over there, and then all of a sudden I had an opportunity from Coach Belichick um, called and said, you know, I got this opening on my staff, are you interested? In all honesty, I kind of before wasn't as interested because I had with with six kids, we had kids in college all the time, mm-hmm. and it was kind of nice because most of them went to the college that I was coaching for, and so it was kind of nice that um, I was around. Right. And so, but then all of a sudden we're empty nesters and <laughs> and uh, uh, able to kind of pick up and go. And I thought, okay, well, now's the time to do it. If I don't like it, I'll go back to college. Mm-hmm. I've never tried it. So, you know, I mean, it's a little later in my career uh, for most coaches. I mean, I'd already been coaching 30 years right, yeah. when I go to the NFL. Yeah. So uh, I said, hey, well, let's see what it's like. Yeah. I, I don't know what it's like. I hear rumors of what it's like. And... Uh, so let's give it a shot. And obviously being with New England at that point in time wasn't, wasn't a bad choice. Nah. So I thought I got an opportunity here, um, talked it over with my wife, let's do it. And uh, that's what started the NFL career. What was kind of the initial, I don't know what the word, cult, like culture shock of making the jump from college to professional coaching? Because I feel like there's a jump from that, like there's a, there's differences from the high school level to the college level, and I'm sure there's differences between the college level to the professional level. For you, kind of what was initially that aha moment I'm in the NFL? Well, there's sometimes I still pinch myself <laughs> after 50 years saying, how, how did we ever get here I'm from Elmwood High School in Ohio? But, you know, I think that's, that's the – I think that's the approach you don't want to take as a coach mm. is that I don't think I coached in college any different than I coached in high school. At least I hope I didn't. Mm-hmm. I hope that if, if somebody walked in that was on my high school team or one of my college teams and watched me coach today, they would say, yeah, that's the same guy that coached me because I coach them the same way. And like we talked about the other day about teaching and learning yeah. and everybody learns at a different rate. Well, just because a guy has now become – a pro well just two months earlier he wasn't a pro our rookies were in college you know six months ago right and so they didn't all of a sudden transform into a professional athlete in six months they're still the same guys that were in college six months ago 
So don't I need to really approach them the same way? And same way with college kids. They were just in high school, you know? And I think if you approach it that way, you, you're, you just you teach. Don't assume that because a guy's a pro, okay, well, boy, he, is a, he knows all this stuff. He doesn't. He's a, an elite athlete mm -hmm. because he's reached the next level. He's one of those 2% guys that makes it. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't learn the same way that all the other guys learn. It doesn't mean that you still shouldn't coach him the same way and tell him here's how you'd like to have it done and also get back his feedback. Now, as guys become seasoned pros and they've been in the league for six, eight years, mm -hmm. they've seen the game from a different view than you've seen it as a coach. They've played it. You've coached it. You know, how you see it on film may not be how they see it on the – so you get – you start at getting more input from them. Mm -hmm. I've, I've told – I've told all of our players, and I've told the coaches, I've learned more football from players sometimes than I have from other coaches because mm. they see it. They yes. played it. They did it. You know, and, and it makes sense to them then. And so you got to see it from their eyes. So I don't think that there was a moment I, – I really went in – to New England, even though they were, you know, at the top of their game, and I'm walking in there and I'm coaching four linebackers. I'm coaching Teddy Bruschi, Willie McGinnis, Mike Vrabel, um, a guy named Ted Johnson, these guys. I mean, Junior Seau. I mean, the names that I got, I really felt like, okay, I need to be the same guy up in the front of the linebacker room because I wasn't the coordinator at first. Mm -hmm. I was two years linebacker right. coach before I became a coordinator. I need to be the same guy in front of that room that I was as a college coach. And I was. Mm -hmm. And so I approached it no different. I didn't assume they knew anything. I just did it. And they didn't look at me like, oh, come on, don't you know who you're talking to? Not at all. Y you'd be shocked. And it's like guys always talk about, well, what was it like to coach Ray Lewis? You know, Ray Lewis wanted to be coached. Yeah. Now, did he know a lot about the game? Absolutely. Guy played forever and was great at what he did. But he also didn't want you to be a guy just, hey, go do what you need to do. He wanted you to tell him, this is what we need to do. This is how we need to do it. He may have, he may come back at me and say to me, well, you know, I've done it this way. What do you think about that? And that's great. Right. Grady Jarrett does that. I mean, all the good ones do that. Mm -hmm. They want to still be coached. It's just from the coach's perspective, Maybe in high school, I didn't listen to somebody <laughs> want to do it their way because I knew they didn't know. Right. This guy, I do listen to him because mm -hmm. they've done it. But like the rookies, I, they're, they're still college guys to right. me. I, I really like how you're talking about getting input from these guys, guys like Ray Lewis, guys like Grady Jarrett now. And I know that the signal, signal callers meeting um, that you do on Wednesdays, yeah. yes, Wednesdays, when did you start doing that? And, and was that in kind of an extension of wanting to get these players' input on the game that they're playing? Well, it really, it really, I didn't start it until I got to Baltimore. Okay. Uh, I did not do it at New England, but the idea came from New England because it was, it was – uh, I remember going back one time and talking to a guy I coached with in college, and he asked me, what's it like coaching at New England and coaching in the NFL? Mm. I said, you know what? Coaching the guys at New England were like coaching coaches that know how to play, that mm. can still play, mm -hmm. because they're very knowledgeable right. and they see things and they can make adjustments and they can tell you then, I'll go, why, why did you do that? Well, that's why you learn then as a coach. Well, that sounds pretty good. So I started thinking, you know, you need, with all that expertise out there on the field, then you need to bring that into a, a meeting and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys my game plan first mm -hmm. and then see what you guys think and you can tell by body language you know if somebody's sitting there kind of like this then you know well okay <laughs> not that, that, that's he, he's not buying yeah. it <laughs> so I thought why not do that and then the other thing is you, those guys are kind of your team leaders right and so if you take one from each group and, and some guys, like last year, I brought in a couple guys that were young because I wanted them to be with the older guys because I want them to assume that role yeah. in the future. And so it wasn't so much I was looking for input for them. I wanted them to see how other guys gave me input so they would end up being that in the future. And the thing of it is is that if you're standing up in front of a group 
and you got four guys out there who are your, probably your top players or mm -hmm. your top leaders, mm -hmm. and they're sitting there and nodding their head yes, what do you think the guy next to him is going to do? He's going to nod, yeah, I agree, mm -hmm. that must be good. Now, if they're sitting there going, boy, I don't know about that, well, that's not going to breed confidence in the guys that are sitting next to him. We need all 11 believing in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like anything else. You, if you take the top guys and you make them believe, the other guys are going to follow them. Yeah. When it comes to, I guess, your time with the Patriots, I know we talked a little bit about it yesterday and how it was almost like just go in and don't mess it up. Like, just yeah. don't mess anything <laughs> yeah. up. Um, how did you kind of um, evolve as as a – when you did become the defensive coordinator, how did you evolve as as a coordinator during that time? Well, I think I had been a coordinator for majority of my right. life in high school and college, so mm -hmm. I knew – what it was like having the responsibility of being the coordinator. But, you know, I listened to Romeo Cornell, who was the coordinator uh, when I was there mm -hmm. at, at New England. And I just kind of, you know, watched him and stuff. And, you know, you always have your own way of doing things right. and your own stuff. And I, I will say this about Coach Belichick. He was very good at letting you do your thing. Now, okay. it was still within the parameters of what <laughs> right. he wanted to do. Right. He's still the head coach. But I'm saying it wasn't so rigid about you got to do it this way and you got to act this way. He let you be you, which is how successful coaches should be. Nobody should start. I've seen guys back in the day try to be Bo Schembechler. As mm -hmm. coach. There's only one Bo Schembechler. Right. There was only one Woody Hayes. There's only one Bill Belichick. Mm -hmm. There's only one Nick Saban. They are who they are. Don't be them. Yeah. Be yourself. Yeah, you can take things from them. Mm -hmm. But don't but but be yourself, and that's I just feel, Tori, that I just have always thought that, and um, you know, just it, it's kind of funny how things evolve. Like, <laughs> uh, I'll give you an example mm -hmm. too. Like, for example, but my wife in college, you know, I told you that we had all the players come over to our yes. house and have dinner. Mm -hmm. Well, also, she used to make brownies and cookies and stuff for the college players all the time. Uh -huh. She'd even, had, there'd been some times she'd brought popsicles out to practice. And I'm going, really? <laughs> they loved them. Oh, I'm sure they absolutely they adored it. You know, yeah. I'm going, oh, come on, they, you know, they, come on, really? And she did it, and they loved, loved it. it. So we go to New England, and all of a sudden she's making brownies for me to take in on Saturdays when we had our kind of last day of walkthrough before the yeah. game. And I'm going, really? I mean, you guys are grown men, are families, and stuff. Really? Come on. <laughs> they fought over them. <laughs> and, and she did the same thing in Baltimore. She does the same thing here mm -hmm. in Atlanta. And it's amazing how, like, if she's gone and I don't bring them in, it's like, wh Where what's up? Where's the brownie? Yeah. And we had guys in, at Baltimore used to tell on each other, and they'd go to her and say, you know, this guy took two brownies instead of one. Well, I mean, it's like, <laughs> I go, there. It, it just shows you, though that they're still young men yeah they're not they haven't been seasoned and they mm -hmm. aren't 40 and 50 year old guys that have been seasoned they're still young men yeah and they still want to be treated like that and special and i you know i've always admired her for doing all that stuff and she's so involved in it but that that was kind of a it kind of plays into what you're talking about is just don't treat them any different. Right, yeah. I, I think it becomes, and I think it's something that we've talked about before, but it becomes disingenuous, and, and you want genuine people around you. It, it's something that I always said in my job. It's like I want to present who these people are as people. It's. It, it, I think it's so easy for people to watch these professional athletes and see them – you know, with their helmets on and see them doing these amazing athletic uh, feats. But to actually know that there's a person underneath the helmet and there's a person there who is a genuine person who want, who has goals and ambitions and dreams and families and friends, that's always been something that I've like carried into my job. And I feel like that's very much something that as a coach, it's like, you know, these players as good as anybody. And, and it's always kind of like, I don't know, making sure that you're the last point of defense. Like, no one's getting to these players. These are my guys. Is that yeah. always – I know you've talked so much in press conferences and everything about 
loving your players and, and that's why you do this. But for you, is that kind of how you see your role, even as a coordinator of now almost 50 years? Yeah, it, I, I think it's just the more you know people care about you, the more you're going to do for them. Mm-hmm. You want to satisfy them. Uh, it's like parents. You know parents love you, and so you want to, you're, you, you want to make them proud of you. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, players are kind of the same way to me, to coaches. I want to make my coaches proud of me. And, but, it, it, you know, it's something as simple as even in society of working with somebody and knowing their name. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter what their job is. Mm-hmm. Um, and it could be a custodian or something, but it's just like, how would you feel like it is, how much different is it in the press conference when I say, yes, Tori, mm-hmm. rather than go, yeah. hey, yeah, mm-hmm. like you don't, sure, I know your name. Mm-hmm. How much different does it make to you when I call you by name and say your name? It's respect. Yes, 100%. And, and so it's like, you're doing your job. I respect you doing your job. I know your name. Mm-hmm. I've taken some kind of interest in the fact that I've learned your name. Well, it's that way with players. It's just more dynamic. Yeah. I also want to go back to, you're talking about your wife, and I know the life of a coach's wife is a very interesting one to lead. How has she been your partner in these 50 years? Well, I think the the thing with Mel is the fact that she has taken an interest in my job and Mm -hmm. not just made it. Uh, my job off over here and I got my own thing yes she has her own thing but she's made that part of her interest too Mm -hmm. getting to know the players getting to know about the job and that kind of stuff Um, she even gives me advice on calls sometimes but (laughs) you know how much do you actually take into account do you really I'm not saying because she might (laughs) listen to this so the truth of it is, though, she's taken it, – it's, it's, I'm so lucky to have her because she is taking such an interest mm-hmm. in my job. Right. And like I say, whether it's the, doing the brownies, the popsicle, whatever that is, but it's the other thing. It's, it's all of our kids, our grandkids. You know, in all three Super Bowls, we've taken our entire family to the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. We took 26 people to the last Super Bowl. She even took a couple babysitters. Huh. But it's it's all the kids, too. All of our kids have done their part. I mean, they've all taken off one jersey and put on a new one, and that's who they root for. Mm-hmm. And I can remember the year I retired, and one of the grandkids said to one of my daughters, says, who do we root for now? <laughs> it's like, what it, are didn't, we doing? it didn't really hit me until he said that. Yeah. that like, th- they're, the grandkids are part of it. Everybody's a part of of this job and if you don't make it that way then I think it becomes a job right it becomes more cumbersome well we got to move we got to do this we got to do that you know dad's gone you know whatever I think they've all taken such an interest in it because there's there's good sides and bad sides to every profession oh, of course. right mm-hmm. I mean military people move all over the country mm-hmm. there's there's but the good side is is that they've been around some incredible incredible athletes and players and people yeah and seen them as people not just as this professional guy that's on tv Mm -hmm. they understand that that guy is just like the rest of us Mm -hmm. and wants to be treated like the rest of us so i think for the family and especially for my wife she's taken such a interest and a part in it that's been a blessing for me yeah you talk about uh kind of getting to know people. And someone who I have not had the pleasure of getting to know is Bill Belichick. And I feel like the perception of Bill Belichick is very different perhaps than the person of Bill Belichick. So I was just curious for you, you've worked with him, you worked with him for years. Kind of who, who is this guy? And, and what's kind of some stories of, of who he, he was as a head coach to coach under? Well, I think the thing about Bill is, is that, um, all the guys that, that that I've been around so many successful guys with him, <laughs> Lou Holtz, Nick, oh, yeah. Saban, all those guys, they all have one thing in common. They're all very attention to detail. Mm. Their their work ethic is just unquestionable. I mean, it, it's remarkable. Bill's just is, you know, people want to I, – I don't know what people really label him. All I can do is I can see those guys from the perspective that I see them. Uh-huh. And they're, they're good bosses when they need to be a boss, and they're good friends when they need to be a friend. 
It's the best way I can tell you. Mm -hmm. it, it's, they're all personalities are different. Some are more vivacious than the other ones. Some are very much more, you know, subdued. Right. But all of them, including Bill, he, when we're at work, he's the boss. Mm -hmm. And it's his program, and he's going to run it his way. And it's obviously worked very, very well, <laughs> yeah. better than anybody else has ever done. Yeah. But when he's away from that, he's a good friend. Mm. And it's not like all of a sudden he's going to change his personality from the media. He's, he's, he's guarded in some ways with the media because he's, he doesn't let information out. Yeah. Can respect that, it. And that's the way that's he, who does. he is. Mm -hmm. But he's not going to be one of these guys going to stand up there and tell a bunch of jokes and be, you know, right. oh boy, really, what a, what a personality this guy is. That's not what he wants to be. But he's also not that way as a person, but he is a good friend and a really good person. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that he treated me, my family, all of us with the utmost respect, and that's why I was very loyal to him. And I am to Nick, and I was to Coach Holtz, and, and they all have treated my family great mm -hmm. I love that now I want to get into your years at Baltimore and, and making the move from the Patriots to the Ravens for you what intrigued you about heading to Baltimore and to begin with almost every job I've ever taken has been about people yeah you know I've always told you I didn't I've never really interviewed for a job because yeah only one right really one one, one interview one. Yeah. yeah and so because people said something to some other person <laughs> that got that and that person called me and offered me yeah. a job sometimes i hadn't even met the guys yeah. i'd never met nick saban i'd never met elliot Uzelak at navy i'd never met those guys and so i get these calls i'd never met lou holt <laughs> so people it's still a people business that's why i try to get away from i get off on a tangent on analytics and stuff because <laughs> yeah. it's not a computer game it's not madden football mm -hmm. it still is dealing with people mm -hmm. just like we talk about the players treat them like people not like an object out there playing football well it's the same thing you know going back is just that you know going to new england was it, it's or going from new england to baltimore excuse me was about john harbaugh mm -hmm. john harbaugh played for me in college so what a unique situation to go coach for a guy that you once coached yeah I think the world of John Harbaugh I thought the world of him as a player I knew his dad I knew his family and so you know he he was having success at Baltimore but he, he was a young coach I think it was only like his maybe third year I mm -hmm. think when I went there and he offered me a job and I thought you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go work for this guy. Plus, there were a couple other guys in the staff that I knew really well. One of them was just a great friend who was actually the coordinator at the time, and he wanted me to come be his linebacker coach. And I thought, you know what? A good transition. I need a little change up here. I've been in New England for six years. So I went to Baltimore. Two years later, I became the coordinator. But it was a unique situation coaching for John, having him once been my player. How do you how did you balance that in your head to kind of be like this is now my head coach I was once his coach he's now my coach he's my boss yeah you know and um, I mean he was he was my boss and so I'm gonna do what he wants to do but I knew that he had enough faith in me he evidently must have liked me enough as a coach <laughs> to to have me want to go coach for him so um, it was a matter of well, you know, I, it just it was an open dialogue. It was easy. Mm. It really, really was easy to talk to John. But always remembering this guy is now my, he's my boss, and what he says we're going to do, and we're all going to do it together. And we're going. I can disagree, but when at the end of the day, whatever he wants is what we're doing, and I'm going to be totally on board. It's just like when I went to Tennessee and coached for Mike Vrabel. Yes, he was a former player mm -hmm. of mine at New England. And he used to yell at me all the time because I'd say, uh, what coach? And he'd go, I'm Mike. Don't call me coach. <laughs> call I said, but you are coach. He goes, but I'm Mike. You, I, you were my coach. I said, but you're now my coach. So, and so it was hard for me to ever call him Mike. Yeah. I, I, I'm just so used to calling the head coach, coach. Yeah. 
And I'd, you know, John, I'd call him John once in a while, but a lot of times I just called him Coach Harbaugh. Man, so great. Uh, so at Baltimore, I think that that Super Bowl winning year was a very – I mean, if you go back and you look at that year for y'all, it was such an interesting year. And I know you've talked about it before, um, about how many players that y'all really didn't have access to in terms of like injuries or other things coming up. I feel like, and this is just me thinking from the outside looking in, but it almost felt like that year for someone who's a coordinator had to have been a very stressful but also maybe rewarding year because you probably had to be more flexible because of the situation when you look back on that year and kind of how it unfolded even before you get to the Super Bowl are you proud of kind of what you were able to do in terms of being able to even put a game plan together week in and week out with all the turnover that was happening well I think it's it's a couple a couple things came out of that year is yeah, you're proud of it. You're proud of the coaching staff and the job that everybody did and really, really proud of the players because we had to adapt every week. I yeah. mean, people don't realize we didn't have Ray Lewis for 10 weeks that year. No. We didn't have Suggs for either six or eight weeks. I can't remember what it was, but it was quite a while. Mm-hmm. Well, those are two big parts of, of the puzzle yeah. to keep on winning. So you had to change your game plan, and then we went through a bunch of corners that year, and so we had to change coverage almost every week. In some ways, I think, though, Tori, that, that it was like – it kept you so busy trying to think about what do we need to do to beat this team, how are we going to beat them, that you almost – I don't know if it was a lot of stress because you were really just kind of more yeah. focused on how are we going to do this and how, where, who do we put here and how do we do this and how do we do that. Yeah. And I give the players so much credit because, you know, we change stuff every week to try to figure out how to win, and they did it. And so I give them the, the credit and the coaching staff the credit for, for doing that. And then what happens is what was nice then when we made it to the playoffs, all of a sudden we have Suggs and a fresh Ray Lewis mm-hmm. back and we get on that four game run and win the Super Bowl. Yeah. So it was kind of fun though as a coach because it wasn't like, okay, well we're just so much better than everybody else. We can just go out there and line up and just beat them. You had to actually adapt. But what it also taught me then as a coach, well, if this is so good to do this, why shouldn't I continue to do it even when I do have good players? Mm. You know, mm-hmm. I, that's why, you know, everybody talks about our system being so complex and we have so much. Yeah, it is. But the good thing is, is that if somebody gets hurt in the course of a game, we have something else to go to. What if you don't have something else to go to? Yeah. What if they keep running the same play and you can't stop it? What are you going to say? Hey, play it better? Mm-hmm. Well, at <laughs> some point in time, they're, they're probably playing it as best they can. Right, you yeah. can't stop it. I need to have something to go to to stop it. I don't think you can be that vanilla, and and it's also fun. Yeah, it's also fun for the players, and it's fun for the coaches. Your mind's working all the time. It's not like, okay, we're gonna go out and do the same thing. We're just so much better than everybody else. We're gonna do the same thing every week. It's fun to think up things and new things and try them and and think them out and try to get them to work. And yeah, it, it was a very very rewarding year. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought up the playbook your playbook because there was something that you said at the beginning of last season and I can't remember the exact quote so if I'm misquoting you definitely tell me but you said something along the lines of like only a certain percentage of the playbook had been installed at this point because it was like I'm not going to give guys things that they can't handle and then later in the season I think you were asked like well what percentage is do you have installed now? And I think people probably thought on the outside looking in, like, oh, 90% of the playbook. But you said something along the lines of, like, 70%, maybe. And I found that so very interesting because I think a lot of times people think, like, you have a playbook, you give them to the players, and they have to know it completely by the time training camp starts or whenever. But I feel like that's not necessarily the case, and I I would love to get your perspective on this because – I think people, when they heard, like, oh, he only has so much of the playbook installed, what does that say about the players or what does that say about the team? I actually was like, I think that's purposeful, and it's something that this team needed at this time. For you, when you're installing a playbook, in terms of percentages and how much you're installing, how does it change from team to team or even year to year? 
Well, it it it'll change a lot from year to year depending on how many new players you got and how many guys you got coming back. Mm-hmm. If you got a bunch of guys coming back, you know, now you can expand even more because they already know the first part of it. The the playbook the way things are done is when we talk about you know, and percentages are arbitrary. I right. don't know if it was sixty percent or seventy. <laughs> I, I don't know what it was. It's just is. I don't know if you ever have all of it in, but you you kind of you keep building on it. The mm-hmm. more you have a veteran team, the more you can build on it. The more you have a young team that doesn't. For example, the, let's say you put in a coverage, and those guys need to perfect that coverage before you can tweak it. Mm-hmm. It's not so much you're changing a whole different call. It's just maybe the way you'll play a certain coverage. It's still the same coverage. I gotcha. All right, cover two is cover two. You got two deep guys. You got five guys underneath. All right, that's cover two zone. Well, there's a hundred different ways to play cover two zone, but until you learn to play the first cover two zone correctly, then you can't really go to the next cover two zone. It's going to be the same. I, I, I know this may or may not be making sense, but it's it's like you, it's not like you're changing all new calls. It's like you're changing other calls and you're tweaking them a little mm-hmm. bit to give the quarterback a different look or something like that. But you're not helping your players if they don't yet understand the first one. Right. It's hard to go to the second one. Mm-hmm. It's hard to learn how to subtract if you haven't learned how to add. Yeah. It's hard to learn how to multiply if you haven't learned how to add and subtract. Everything's in an order. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of the same way. You can keep adding. If that if they get that, oh, man, they got that. Okay, we can go on to this then. We can yeah. add this little bit. But until they get that, well, when you're a new team coming in, a new mm-hmm. coaching staff coming in like we were here in Atlanta, mm-hmm. and our scheme was – a lot different than the old defensive scheme. Right. Doesn't make it good or bad. Yeah. Doesn't make it better or worse. People believe in what they believe mm-hmm. in. There's all these different offenses, all these different defenses, and they all work if you have the personnel to do them. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to sit there and try to throw everything at these guys when it's so different from what they just got done playing. Yeah. So until they perfected that, then we can move on. So like, yeah, early on, we didn't have a lot in. Mm-hmm. As the season went on, we added more. Did we ever get to 100%? No, but I don't know if I've ever gotten to everything in the playbook. Right. Um, at, at any place. So when you, I mean, when you're dealing with 60, 70% of your playbook, you're dealing with a lot of That's stuff. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. Especially and, yours, I feel like. And, yeah. yeah, it is because of you accumulated all these years <laughs> right. of stuff. Yeah. And so. Uh, and I throw nothing out. That's the problem. It's, 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 it's just hoarding it all. It is. I'm a hoarder. So, so it's it's that, that percentage is really irrelevant. Mm. The percentage is only good. What percentage of stuff can they learn? Yeah. And that's what's important. Okay, I got you. I'm glad that we got off on that tangent because I feel like that was a lot of like I got I got a lot of questions. It was like, what do you mean they only have this? percentage in and I'm like I think you're overthinking this it's you are and it's not and it really doesn't have it to do with all well, the players can't handle it it's like mm-hmm. no it's it's not that it's you know we got a lot of stuff in even 30 40 percent of a, somebody's playbook is a lot of stuff right yeah I don't think people understand how much it, it's just like you, you've all the stuff I have in the playbook, I have all the stuff from New England. I have all the stuff in college. I have all the stuff from New England. I have all the stuff in Baltimore, mm-hmm. all the stuff that we changed at Tennessee. Well, the thing just keeps getting bigger. You know, so when it was like this at New England, that was pretty easy. Well, then Baltimore gets like, you know, it just keeps getting yeah. bigger. You can't expect the guys from Atlanta to know everything that we've done coaching-wise in the last 40 years. Yeah. There's no way. Right. But that's the playbook. Yeah. So their 60% is still the same thing that the New England guys had, the same thing the Baltimore guys had, same thing the Tennessee guys had. Mm-hmm. It, it's just it, – it's, it's all kind of the same. Yeah. This may be a – I don't know, an, an off-the-wall question, but how do you store your playbook? Like, it, is it in file cabinets – it, do you write you things You're going to try down? to steal it? Or what, I'm, not what gonna, no, to do? I'm not going to try and steal it. I'm, I, I, I promise you I won't steal it, but I may come by and just have a peek one time. <laughs> just run by the office. Hey. It's, it's actually – it's in every book that I have. I have a New England book. I have a Baltimore book. Ah. I have a Tennessee book. I have an Atlanta book. Okay. So I don't keep any all of it in one book. 
It's okay. just whatever we're going to use for Atlanta, I take out of these other ones and I transfer it over. Okay. Same thing when I left New England. Some of the stuff went to Baltimore. Some of the stuff, you know, Baltimore was really playing good defense long before I got there. Right. And same thing with New England. So New England's book is kind of most of the stuff is the stuff that I inherited and then I added to it. Ah. Baltimore, same thing. They were already doing well at Baltimore, so it's Baltimore – what they were doing at Baltimore, plus the stuff that I brought from New England, plus the other stuff that we've kind of changed. Yeah, It just keeps adding on like that. So I just leave it in that book. It's okay. not one big book. So then the stuff that I wanted to play here at Atlanta that came from New England, that came from Baltimore, that came from Tennessee, all went into the Atlanta mm. book. Okay, that makes sense. See, I, that that's the part of the thing, the, I don't know, the interesting quirks of the job. I like hearing how people store everything and write out their notes and all that kind of stuff well there's a lot of stuff then for example that's in the atlanta book over here and then there's here's the new england book over here that never has gotten to the atlanta book these guys don't even know right i've never even tried to put it in yeah same thing with the baltimore book so it's just there's stuff in these books that once in a while i'll be watching a film on another team and going okay, this pressure will work. This is a pressure I ran clear back there. Mm. So I'll take it out of that book and bring it over to the Atlanta book. Ah. It's stuff like that. Love it. Um, Okay, I I do want to ask this question because it's something that I've always been curious about. Um, The the Super Bowl with with the Ravens, was that the blackout bowl? Yes, it was. Please walk me through what you're thinking (laughs) as the coordinator when, I guess, like, the lights go out like where were you what were you doing it was like a 34 minute time period in which y'all had to just stop everything well I was in, I was in the press box yeah you know calling the defense and then all of a sudden the lights went out and we just kind of figured it was a uh, short or somebody had there was an accident somewhere or something somebody hit a pole and it blew up something <laughs> yeah. that it would come right back on and we didn't know how long it was going to happen and then I can remember sitting in the press box and we could still communicate down to the field with the headsets. Okay. So the lights were off, but we still had communication through the headsets. And I remember Coach Harbaugh going off on the <laughs> officials because they were talking about the lights coming. No, I take that back. The headsets did go down. Mm. And he was talking about the – we had a walkie-talkie that we could only use <laughs> and that – if the lights came back on, they were going to restart the game, whether the headsets were on or not. Oh, gosh. And he goes, well, wait a minute. My coordinator is in the press box. That's not fair. So then we're trying to figure out, can we come down? Mm-hmm. Well, we couldn't come down because the electric was off. There was no elevators. Oh, gosh. So it was like, we don't know what the heck's going to happen here. And so then finally they had said no, that if they do that, that they would give us time to come down and mm-hmm. do all that stuff. And it, it wouldn't be that because John was livid. <laughs> and... Uh, then we just kind of just sat there and just waited till the lights came back on and and started up again. I think that's so that that part of that Super Bowl is honestly what makes that Super Bowl almost as memorable as what it was because that was something that had never happened before. No, that and was crazy. I I, I, was, I I so I'm glad that I I finally was able to ask you that question because that's been something that's been on my mind for years. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so okay, let's fast forward now to going to Tennessee, and uh, yeah, I know you talked about you know with Mike Rabel getting to coach a, with a player that who's now a coach, who you coach, right. <laughs> it's yeah. like all those, yeah. all the words. Um, for But that was also, was that the first time that you met Arthur Smith? Was at Tennessee? Yes. yes. What were your first impressions of him? Very good. He was a tight end coach. At that right. time, he wasn't in the offensive coordinator. He was a tight end's coach. Uh, and I remember doing, you know, what happens is you're, you're really not around the offensive guys a lot. You know them because you're in yeah. a staff meeting with them and stuff, but you're not corresponding with them every day and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I met Arthur and, and knew him and stuff like that. And but the first time that we had a – we did a um, – we had to do a uh, press conference together, oh. he and I. And it happened to be, I don't know, just I think probably everybody had to do a press conference and, hey, this day, Dean, it's going to be you and, and Arthur Smith. And I remember being there at the press conference and watching him talk as the tight end coach. And I go, this guy is sharp. This guy is really sharp. This guy is – good young coach 
And I, that, that was my first real impression of him because we had maybe been there for three, four weeks or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it also told me something about Arthur in that when you go through coaching changes, most head coaches come in and want to bring their guys in, yeah. the guys that there's a comfort level with, and I know what he does, and there's, they're their guys. Yeah. This guy keeps staying on with all these different head coaches. Mm-hmm. Tells you something about the guy and the respect that the new guy has coming in for him to keep him. Because it's just it's pretty easy. Most coaches think if my head coach gets fired, we're all gone. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure Arthur thought, I'm gone. But he never was. Mm-hmm. He kept staying on with all these different head coaches, including Mike. And I'm going, that tells you a lot about – what people think of him, what people in the building have said about him, mm-hmm. what loyalty and what respect people must have for him. Told me a lot about him. Mm-hmm. Your time at Tennessee, what kind of was different about it in comparison to your time with the Patriots and the Ravens? I don't know if there was any difference. There was um, one thing about the Patriots and then the Ravens, there's a there's an aura of yes. success. Yes. There is. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I'm not trying to no, you're, you're blow exactly smoke right. or anything else or belittle anybody else, but there was an expectation at New England to win. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the year that we went undefeated in 07, yeah, the offense was number one in the league, but I think we were third or fourth on defense. Mm-hmm. So it was like both sides of the ball were good. There was just an expectation when you walked in the building of winning and and that Baltimore it was the same way with John there was just a and especially on defense there was just because they have been good since 2000 right in defense I mean there's just not many down years in there mm-hmm. all the way up through and it's just the expectation was there I didn't quite feel the expectation at Tennessee even though they'd been nine and seven the year before and yeah. won a game in the playoffs uh, Mariota took them to the playoffs, and they beat Kansas City the first round and got beat. Uh, and, and so, but I didn't f- quite feel the aura, you know. Or, and then the other thing a little bit about it is, is like in Baltimore, it's such a blue-collar town. Football is everything. The thing about Nashville mm-hmm. is it's Nashville. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot going on there's in a Nashville. Lot, there's a lot and, more It stuff. doesn't have to do with football. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a destination city. Right. You know, more when we play other teams that would come in, they'd have as many fans as we did because if you're in Buffalo, you want to go to Nashville for the weekend and enjoy your weekend yeah. or Philadelphia or any of those northern places that get inundated by uh, people coming in and they want to go to Nashville for the weekend. So it, there's some, it's an entertainment city more than it was a football city. Yeah. Baltimore's a football city. You know, there's certain cities that are. New England became that because they started winning so much. It became yeah. New England, not the Boston Patriots anymore, the New England Patriots. So Tennessee was a little different in that aspect. But players were the players. I mean, mm-hmm. it was the same thing. There wasn't maybe as many big-name guys as there was like at Baltimore. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the Jarrell Casey's and those guys, I mean – they were great players I had I had fun yeah I had fun just as much fun you know as I've had at those other two places it's same way here Mm -hmm. I'm I'm having fun here yeah well it's it's funny too because you talk about having fun and um you know I I think a lot of people know this about you but you retired in 2019 and then took the 2020 season off and then came out of retirement to come here to Atlanta right What, what was that year like in retirement how how did you know that you wanted to get back in and how quickly did you know that you wanted to get back in well there's 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 two things about that year one the good thing about being off was it was the covid year ah yes that's right Mm -hmm. so every coach that i talked to said they were miserable horrible (laughs) because of all zoom meetings and all this and staying in the hotels and it just wasn't like football and you're playing in front of empty stadiums Mm -hmm. So that part of it, I didn't miss because everybody told me you picked a good year to retire. Yeah. The part that I did miss is that I was doing a radio show on Fridays uh, in Nashville talking about the opposing team's offense. Mm -hmm. And so the Titans were nice enough to give me film 
and a computer that I could watch the other teams. Like if they were playing Indianapolis, I could watch Indianapolis games and I could break it down so I could talk on the radio and actually sound like I knew what I was talking That's about. That's why he's so good on the podcast. He has this experience. <laughs> no. So, <laughs> but what happened was, as I started watching this film going, I wouldn't do that. No, I wouldn't do that. No, no, what are they doing? You know, and it's like all of a sudden I started missing it. Yeah. And then Mel and I went to one home game. When they finally started opening it up, I couldn't take it. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't sit there and watch the game. And it's like driving me nuts. I missed it so much being down there with yeah. the players and, and calling the game and stuff like that. And I really missed it. But at the same time, I was retired. Mm. And my wife had bought me a golf membership. So I was playing <laughs> golf a couple times a week. And so I was enjoying that. You know, we had thought about we were going to travel a lot, mm -hmm. but obviously COVID right. put an end to that, mm -hmm. that whole thing. So, you know, you're, I kind of, I'm sitting around and not, I'm doing puzzles for the first time <laughs> in my life. And I'm doing puzzles and I'm doing this, this radio thing and I'm really missing it. Yeah. But at the same time, I had gotten a call from a couple other guys that were going to be, were interviewing for head coaches. They hadn't gotten jobs, gotcha. but they were interviewing. Would you be interested if I did get the job of coming out of retirement? And I said, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So then when Arthur and I talked, it was different. Mm -hmm. It's all about people. I told you, that's, that's, I went to Tennessee because it was Mike Vrabel. I went to Baltimore because it was John Harbaugh. Mm -hmm. I went to New England because it was New England and, right. and Bill. Yeah. But I also had known Bill for years and years. I coached with his father right. at the Naval Academy. So mm -hmm. I knew Bill. Every job I've ever taken, I took because I kind of – in, in the NFL has been because I knew the guy that was the head coach. Mm -hmm. And I just had so much respect for Arthur. I said, this, this will be a good situation. Mm -hmm. And so Mel and I talked about it um, and discussed it. It wasn't a very long discussion. And so it, it's great. And, and she, that's the other thing about her is she's been great. You know, here I am coming out of retirement twice. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's like, some people wouldn't have been real tolerable <laughs> and she goes hey if that's what you want to do let's, let's we'll do it yeah that was going to be my question is how did she what was that conversation like with her because I mean honestly I'm sure you're around a lot more in that year that might have been that the reason have... why she wanted me to go back maybe. but the first one when the two weeks that I was retired I, know, I, was about after to say, Baltimore, I don't even consider that no and because she just that, that one though at first she was a little bit about, like, I thought we were going to travel because COVID wasn't then. Right, yeah. The other one was after, with COVID around, it was kind of like, yeah, we aren't going anywhere. We yeah. aren't doing anything. And, and we are together all and, the time. And there was really, I think it was really last year was a little bit different for her mm -hmm. because it was still kind of COVID last right. year. I, I, yeah, we were in the stands, but you couldn't have, like, get-togethers after the right. game like we used to always have with all the players and you She'd meet the players' wives and the players' kids and the other coaches' wives and coaches' kids. And she runs a bubble, a Bible study with coaches' wives, which is good. But I think she, excuse me, really missed it last year too because it's just she couldn't get us involved. So I'm hoping now, this next year now, yeah. that'll, that'll change. Yeah, I hope so too. It's funny because I have been in this job for about a year because, you know, I was with The Athletic for the COVID year and then now I'm here and – I n hadn't gotten into the building until like two months ago, yeah. like at all. Like I, I was in the building for like one week and then they shut it down and I've actually been working out of the dorms. That's mm. where I, that's where I've been working for the last like, for like the six months of the season. Yeah, it, it's, it's just been different. It's really crazy, different. yeah. Um, well, I did want to kind of wrap all this up talking about the team of which, you know, <laughs> we're here for yeah, yeah, by the way <laughs> by the way we should maybe talk about the the falcons um i i think it's really interesting <coughs> because um you talk about the the memorable teams that you've worked with and and how when it's a project it almost makes it more fun it makes it almost more memorable more meaningful and i feel like that's what this is i feel like where this organization is right now it's a project and it's a it's a built it's building for you was that something that intrigued you i know obviously coming and working with arthur smith was priority numero uno right but 
was that something that intrigued you as well? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it did. And and I also the other thing I knew about Arthur is Arthur's not going to take a job that he doesn't feel like he can get turned around and be successful. Mm. He wasn't going to take a job because oh, I, I, I need to be a head coach. Yeah. Quote. He's going to take a job. He interviewed for all of them. Right, yeah. So it's not like he was just going to, you know, i got to be a head coach. It's, it's going to be I'm going to pick the place that I feel like great ownership, great organization. I have a chance to win, turn this thing around. Obviously, if you're interviewing – the program's down because you know they're not usually changing right. head coaches unless the guy goes somewhere else. I mean, all th- that's that's just part of the business. Yeah, just so nature. yeah, it was because Art Smith, but yeah, you know, part of that was. And I will also say that even going seven and ten mm-hmm. last year, I could not have been more proud of the defense. Mm-hmm. I love these guys. These guys gave it what they had. They played their hearts out. Uh, could I really felt like we probably had a chance to win a couple more games and, mm-hmm. and maybe we were we were right there at the end up until a couple games to go we were still had a shot at making the playoffs mm-hmm. once you get in the playoffs who knows right but I I just really I really loved coaching this team last year mm-hmm. and I love coaching it right now too I, I really feel like we are about to turn a corner mm-hmm. that's going to make everybody proud yeah and I think the people and the fans are hungry for it mm-hmm. I like that um, and I just think that our players are very hungry. They're very coachable. I, I enjoy going into that meeting room every day. Yeah. How much – I've talked to a few assistants about this over the course of, like, the draft process. How much are you in the meetings in terms of, hey, I, li- I would like to acquire this guy. This guy's on the free agency market. I like him. Or, hey, this guy, I, I saw him – at the combine, I really like him. How much are you in those conversations? Oh, very much. Yeah, we all of us, all the coaches are. I mean, um, Terry and and uh, all, and and Art take all of our input along with the the head scouts, Kyle, and all those guys. Mm-hmm. It's it's really a collaboration of everybody. You know, they don't they don't want to bring in somebody that we really don't want. Right. And then, but. Also, what we our jobs as coaches look at the guy. Does he fit our system? Will he be the guy that we want? They got to do all the other groundwork as far as things off the field. Mm-hmm. You know, has, he, has the guy been in trouble? Has he been all this guy? The other part of it is that we play no part in is financial. That, yeah, I was you know, about to ask have, you that. Yeah, well, we don't. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what the salary cap is. I don't even. <laughs> I don't care. What? Why should I want to know what some guy's making? I don't really care. Yeah. He should be playing because he's the best player. Whether he's making ten million, one million, or twenty-five, you know, hundred. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm going to play the best guy that, that's playing that position at the time. So we can sit there and say, "Hey, we really like this guy as a free agent." I did last year. Mm-hmm. Dean, we can't afford him. Okay. What do you want me to say? Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Can't I'll afford go. him. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go to the next one. Yeah. So, but do, are they going to ask us? Yeah. Are we going to give us them our opinion? Yes. Mm-hmm. Then it's just a matter of there's other parts to it that we don't have. And yeah. it's the same thing with Art. Like when they go into the draft, okay, he isn't going to draft all – I want all defensive players. <laughs> yeah. They were going once all offensive players. Well, that can't be, and we need special teams players. So there's a lot – of decisions that have to be made. You got two guys up here that are fairly equal that you want to take as first round picks. Well, they got to make a decision which one is really more valuable to the team. Mm. Yeah, I want the defensive guy. Offensive guys want the offensive guy, but they got to make a decision. This guy's the best fit right now for what we need. Yeah. And so uh, there's just a, there's a lot of things, but yes, we are very heavily involved. Yeah. I I think it's interesting because that's something that uh, the, the salary cap, I feel like, is just this mythical thing that everyone talks about. It's really, I think, convoluted and, and difficult to, for some people to get their minds around. I know when I first started covering the league, like, I spent a week just trying to understand, like, okay, what's dead money? Like, wh- what what are all these terms and what do they mean and why are they important? And I, I think it's interesting because you have people in the building who specifically work cap. You have these cap crunchers, and then you have the scouts that are constantly thinking about, like, okay, can, is talking about can we afford this person? How much are you cognizantly thinking about that? I mean, I think about the uh, Grady Jarrett extension that we just saw happen. Um, how much are you sitting there like, 
okay, please find the money to, to bring this guy back. Yeah, it, that's, but that's about all it is for us. So yeah. We're just hoping right. that we have the money. We, we really, as coaches, you sit back and you kind of take that totally out of the equation. Mm. Do, would you like to have this player? Yes. Yeah. Period. That's all I need to say. Mm. I can't – I don't know about the rest of it. I yeah. don't want to know about the rest of it. You know, do I want Grady Jarrett to be – get extension? Abs- when they ask me, absolutely. You want this guy back? Yes. Yeah. Forever. You know, Please. I don't want him to ever leave Atlanta. That's all I can say. Yeah. And the rest of it's up to them whether they can get the negotiations and all that stuff done. Mm-hmm. Our job as coaches is do you want this guy as a player? Do you not want this guy as a player? Yes or no? Mm-hmm. And that's, I feel like that's, that's all we give them. Then it's up to them to hopefully negotiate it out if they can. There you go. I, I think it's really – you said something a couple minutes ago about really feeling like this organization is turning a corner. And something that I keep telling people is – and especially when y'all first came in here, when Terry and Arthur first came in here, I, I wrote so many times, it's like, look, this is a process. This is not a, a – it's not something that's going to happen overnight. And we actually had AJ Terrell on the Falcons final whistle podcast not too long ago. And I asked him a word to describe 2022. And he said marathon. He was like, this organization, we're in a marathon. We're not in a sprint. We're in a marathon. We want to have long-term success. Um, For you, when you're thinking about where this organization is, what does excite you about the future of it? I just think we're getting the right people. Well, we and I'm not saying that the other people that were here were the wrong people. I'm just saying that every head coach has a personality, and that team should reflect his personality. And you want people around you that reflect your personality and buy into what you're trying to do. If if we're coaching for Arthur Smith, we all need to be in Arthur Smith's you know, wheelhouse yeah. of what he wants and what does he want. I can't have like, well, I want to do it my way on defense. I'm going to do – he hired me to do the defensive job, but if he wants something a certain way, he we need to buy in and do it. And we need players the same way. And I love – it's it's called a culture, and, and everybody has their own, and they're all different. And so – but you got to be what the guy – want you to be and I just feel like we are making tremendous strides that way and we just just I can just feel it in in the players that they're buying into everything that we want to get done and they're trying their best to do it that's all you can really ask somebody to do is just give it give it your best we want tough guys we want physical guys we want smart guys but we also want good character guys Mm -hmm. You want guys that are out in the community and are doing community service and the people fans can relate to and you're not reading about them in the headlines all the time for the bad reasons. Yeah. And so, and and we're doing that. Arthur's doing that. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's interesting too. There are just so many young guys that you kind of can um, mold into what you kind of hope that they become and having visions for them and, um, I almost feel like those guys are, they come in and they're like sponges and they're just like, they're so jazzed just to be in the league at large <laughs> that mm-hmm. they're just like, let's just go, just throw me out there and go. And with this team, it is a young team. Do you feel that youth <laughs> when you're around these guys? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I feel it. But also that's why the Grady Jarrett's and those guys are so totally. valuable because if you don't have a guy like that, that the D lineman come in and watch him work every single day on how he works mm-hmm. and how he prepares, that those are examples. As a coach, I grew up watching other coaches as examples. Yeah, you know, kids watch their parents. You know, they're good examples. That's how you become a good parent, mm-hmm. right? It's so, it's it's no different, and that's why those guys, even though there's a lot of youth. The guys that are the Jake Matthews, the yeah. Grady Jarrett's, those kind of guys are so important because they are going to be the examples to these guys. This is how you do it. Absolutely. Well, that wraps up our final peas in the pod <laughs> segments. <laughs> I, I hope that you do like this name. Uh, we're we're going to stick with it because I think it's fantastic. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us for the last, gosh, 
two hours of, of chats. I've really, really appreciated it. And I think the fans are really going to love it too. So well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Too. Absolutely.